so what we'll do now is is we'll we'll sort of chat uh, we can circle back to this conversation that we are having right. with the smaller group uh, but now i think it uh, it might be a good time uh, for for us to get more of an idea to the man behind the beard and uh, so who we are, who we are talking to if you could just uh, if you could just sort of just talk us through uh, your journey and 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 what is uh, what has brought you uh, what has brought you to where you are today we can we can start to that and then we'll uh, we'll dig deeper uh, as we go along sure. and, uh, um, so and of course uh, again thanks for coming and and sharing your time with us thank you so uh, what i you know i'm a doctor by training what i currently do is i sort of work at the intersection of medicine technology and with a big focus on what we call primary care which is everything around that gp that we spoke about a few minutes ago uh so we do things like uh design new models of primary care figure out what the future of primary care should look like uh how can technology be used and these are areas that i work in so i don't see patients anymore it's been a long time since i've seen patients and seen a clinical doctor um i will tell you about uh how i got here i think i got here very accidentally i uh when i was growing up i wanted to be a fighter pilot i uh and and that was really the goal uh we when we had my 12th standard exams i uh you know my maths paper didn't go very well i remember i don't know if you guys still have that we had a section d which had like a lot of marks on it uh, and i was solving my paper very slowly it got to the point where i couldn't solve the last section which had uh, a bulk of these you know 10 mark questions so when that maths paper didn't go very well uh, and my family was very like you know my mother was very uh, you know you have to score well you have to do well etc so i wanted to do well at some exam right like some exam so that i can just tell the location okay, here i've done well uh, so i found out that there was that year there was a entrance exam for medicine uh, for the first year mhct was starting we were the first batch that went through the mhct so i okay. said this is a point of honor i have to like make a point at home so i locked myself in a room for like some 3 months or whatever studied for that mhct and gave the exam hmm. uh and then i was waiting for my nda call letter because i'd done the nda exam also and i thought you know i'll go to the nda or to the air force hmm. academy uh fly a mirage that's what i really wanted to do right uh, so in the meantime the you know so uh, Twelfth and results came weren't very great, uh, but I was at Xavier, so I thought I'll continue and like start a BSc Physics in Xavier. So I started a BSc Physics, and uh, about and it was fun because it was you know I was going back to the same campus, my same friends, uh, and it was a fun time about a month. And then these medical results came, and uh, the rank was like shockingly good. So I had to made my point. I thought, "Chalo, ho gaya." uh but then everybody was like okay you've gotten medicine like you know who gets a medicine seat you should go at least check it out go see see what this is right, right. so i said theek hai abhi bsc kar raha hu i'll you know instead of sitting at xavier's and chilling i'll go uh, go through my medical counseling uh, get a medical seat and then still you know wait for my nda and then go become an air force pilot hmm. so went uh, to jj hospital for the first time to uh, collect the uh, the ct results I was like, "Oh, it's an I don't know if you've seen JJ. It's in Baikula. It's an old uh, college built in 1857. Uh, quite beautiful, quite haunting. If you've seen Munna Bhai MBBS, the lecture hall in which uh, a lot of the scenes in that movie are shot uh, was my first year lecture hall. So that's where I went to collect. So I was quite blown away by like how majestic this looks and how cool this right. is. Right? Like, so I was like, "Okay, this is this might be fun." and uh, got the results start uh, and then went to counseling and then got admission at jj for my mbbs so i started start my mbbs there uh, um i remember sort of day one day one you go into that same big lecture hall it's like a theater you go sit there uh, you know bunch of professors come and talk to you most of them sound sort of boring but it's mm. it's still medicine there's a skeleton hanging in the room so which i found very cool um and uh, then they take you for dissection and uh, that's when my mind was blown so dissection is like 20 bodies in this giant room and uh, you you have those bodies for that year and then you cut and you figure out uh, you know which muscle is what which bone is what uh, and you learn anatomy on these bodies 
and i was this was unreal right like i hadn't imagined in my wildest dreams that i would be standing at a table cutting open a person uh, mm-hmm. and learning all these things uh, and uh, at the same time also made some really great friends uh, in that period and by the time the nda results came and i had to go for my services selection board i had sort of really started liking this whole situation okay. that uh, so although i you know and and although i had some fights at home and i said no no i'll go become a pilot etc i'm going to give mm. up the seat i ultimately did right. uh, so stayed in medicine finished my mbbs uh, and it's quite quite you know it's very rewarding especially as you the first few years of mbbs i mean it's very very tough with you have to work really hard and you have to study really hard uh and you try and manage to have a fun life as well as study but uh towards the end when you start seeing patients uh, you realize that there are very few professions that are as rewarding because essentially you're sitting in a room somebody comes to you with a problem uh they trust you they don't know you from adam right but they trust you because you're sitting in that seat and you're wearing a stethoscope or a white coat or whatever right. they will tell you their problems very openly uh, knowing that you'll keep it completely confidential and they will trust you to solve solve it right and you tell them to do something and they'll go do it uh so it's sort of instant gratification like every mm. you know every patient you see you feel like you've done some good in the world uh so that was quite again quite mind blowing right like it's not uh, it's very very immediately you sort of get uh, as a physician sitting in a but uh, so after my mbbs i started uh, working in primary health i used to run clinics that i'm a clinic in uh, and this was in 2004 2005 when the hiv epidemic was uh, you know sort of running through the country so i started working on clinics for female sex workers in this uh, area called bandup sonapur it's a red light district uh, so we ran a clinic that focused on hiv and on uh, sexually transmitted infections worked with mm-hmm. male sex workers in another place uh, saw some really difficult sort of circumstances um uh, and uh, that sort of motivated and, and then i thought okay you know while clinical medicine is good uh, ultimately i at that point was seeing patients where they, i would see a patient the patient would fall sick the patient would come to me i would give them some medicines and fix them right but like sala chhe mahine baad wapas wo patient aata hai you know it come mm. back with like the same ailment so i was like okay i feel like i'm applying bandaid because the reason mm. people are falling sick is outside the clinic right you know it's not Uh, and that's when i started getting interested in public health mm-hmm. which is not looking at the individual itself but looking at the health system broadly and saying okay, what can we do how can we change uh, even the reasons people fall sick mm-hmm. uh, so <coughs> excuse me so in the story earlier uh, uh, myra story earlier where uh, you know her masi had uh, this these kidney fail really the question is you know could this have been prevented because once right. bad things have happened it costs a lot it's very painful uh, it's very hard to fix but can could things have been done earlier to prevent that right and that's really when i started getting into in public health so then i gave my gre went uh, went to the us went to harvard got uh, a degree in public health and uh, started working uh, in the us with a with an interesting organization there are there are social venture fund uh, called acumen can you fund. talk yeah. a little bit about what uh, a degree in public health means and uh, sure. i'm not sure we understand that um so public health is a fairly wide field uh, you uh, the core of it is really uh, and as in good currency now right because mm. the core of public health uh, is really epidemiology and biostats mm. and uh, epidemiology is essentially the study of epidemics right like right. so you you study uh, and it's it's quite interesting so you you're actually studying uh, very fundamental concepts you're studying the idea of causality so you know why does x cause y so right now mm. there are a lot of questions that are causal that we don't have good answers to that mm. you try and solve with data over time so for example uh, i'm trying to think ha huh, does chloroquine you know cure covid right. it mm. was a question for i mean i think it's mostly sorted and solved right, right. now but it was an open question for a long time and and solved in which direction uh, i don't think it has any effect right no so, I, i just wanted i just wanted you to say yeah, that <laughs> it has yeah it has it has no effect uh, right. but for a long time we all thought it has an effect india yeah. 
said okay everybody should take chloroquine but that's a causal mm-hmm. you know question about causality ki mm-hmm. does x cause y mm-hmm. and uh, it's not as simple right so for example if i say that if i you know if i drop this pen the pen will fall down i know mm. that that will happen every time i do it mm. but when i'm talking about say things like will this drug cure this disease how do you actually find out if this drug cures this disease right mm. um, and frankly what we our gold standard right now is you run this massive experiments uh, and we call them sort of randomized controlled trials where you have two sets of people that are very similar right so because ideally you're trying to figure out uh, you know how do these people react to something and then you want to compare the results so you say mm. there are 100 people on this side and 100 people on that side both sets of people have covid ek ek ko main chloroquine dunga ek solo ko chloroquine dunga aur in solo ko chloroquine nahi dunga right and then you see what happens to them but it's a very hard experiment to run because you know right. if, because even right now if i tell you that Oh, there is this drug that we think might help, but you won't mm. get it because you're in this control arm. Right. Where so so there's this complexity is there, and it's very mm. hard to run these experiments. Uh, but that is sort of so public health sort of came out of this idea of you know why do epidemics happen? Why do people die? How do we help prevent those? But that was that's and that's the core. There's a lot of statistics, a lot of experimentation around uh, human disease. but then there is a lot more in public health right then there is the economics of care so you study for the first time i studied i had a course in class in economics and i studied economics of uh, you know basic macroeconomics but also then the mm-hmm. economics of healthcare uh, you also have to study a little bit of philosophy and morality because in healthcare there's a lot of moral choices you're making mm. uh, you know you because resources are always limited especially at a, uh, at a at a level where uh, you're not talking about a whole population or a city or a, or a country and there are lots of moral questions there you know who will you save because mm. ultimately you can't save everybody right. so public health sort of teaches you so it, it's some formal training in in a range of these things uh, there are all kinds of people who study public health there are various kinds of degrees you can get in public health you don't have to be a doctor to study public health uh, you can mm-hmm. also do master in science after your uh, a science degree is useful because then you know these some of these concepts are easier to understand uh, but you could do an economics degree and then study public health after that and your right. economics would still be relevant Uh, yeah. what i studied was i studied i did a professional masters in public health so most of my classmates uh, were either doctors or had you know some medical backgrounds who wanted mm-hmm. to know more about public health uh, so that's that's sort of does that answer uh, your question yeah 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 so uh, so now you you said that you uh, you made the choice uh, so you you were uh, you were a clinician and then you said that no i don't think uh, i'm i'm doing a good enough job or, or i'll be able to solve the problem at this level and i need to go up one level and and therefore uh, you uh, you chose to go and study uh, public health so that's where you were in your uh, in the story yeah, so of, of the other thing was that i was working on all these programs that were run by you know you know let's say gates foundation is paying for something somebody else is paying for a program and mm. i felt those programs were run very poorly and uh, i was also young and naive so i thought yeah right i can do better such, i can do better right like yeah. but to do better i have to go get those degrees first and right. go study so that sort of another thing that pushed me on this path uh, mm. and uh, when i was in the us i also had the opportunity to so public health itself was sort of my course itself was a little mind expanding for me because mm. you know, i studied science and then i studied medicine i didn't know anything about economics i didn't know anything right. about uh, anything else and uh, definitely had never taken a philosophy class in my life right. for example uh, so it was kind of cool to do all of that and mm. learn things that you know i otherwise wouldn't have learned at the same time i uh, got introduced to this idea of social entrepreneurship and and people building businesses that were socially relevant Mm. and uh, and i frankly came you know came across this idea through a class like there was a class okay. on social entrepreneurship not at my so in us universities you can cross register at, at other colleges within the same university so i was studying public health but i did this class at the school of government there's a school of government there which mm. uh, the kennedy school of government so i did this class there and uh, that itself was very exciting because you know you could possibly build a business that is actually solving some of these core issues and uh, i started work and you know very and you know life was a lot lot of 
life is about luck life is very random so like you know mm. throws things at you and then uh you have to pick the things that you want to follow and sometimes you get lucky right so i think i got right. lucky with meeting some people who were working in this space uh doing uh, funding social enterprises across you know india east africa pakistan the us and uh, they were a they were a venture fund in in sort of the traditional sense mm. where where people would come and raise money to set up these enterprises the only condition was that the enterprise should be uh, focused on solving a critical social problem so it could have it mm. could have been education could have been health could have been water and sanitation could be housing right. could be agriculture any of these things uh, and they had a solid health uh, portfolio there a bunch of uh, hospitals clinics uh mm-hmm. you know pharmaceutical manufacturing things that they had invested in and i thought that that would be a great role because i was you were sitting at a place where people are coming and pitching you new ideas every day because everybody wants to raise money uh and it was a great role because you sit there and you see like you know on an average day you can see 20 different cool ideas somewhere else somewhere happening somewhere in the world uh so i worked with them uh, i was very curious about africa so i moved from uh the us to nairobi which is where uh, acumen also had an office and spent a year in nairobi and east africa traveled a bunch around there um, and i guess at that point there was at this at this point where i was thinking of you know i need to uh, i can't just be sitting here and like handing money out and telling people what to do i haven't ever done these things so should, you know i should i had this keen out to go do something myself and build something right. myself and uh, that's when i met my co-founder uh, at this company i started and moved back to india uh, because the other thing also was that you know i didn't feel like uh, sure like you know there were lots of problems in africa but i really wanted to solve an indian problem like i wanted to come back and do stuff here so I came back to india uh, set up a company called mira doctor in uh, almost exactly 10 years ago now um and uh, what we were trying to do uh, and this company ran for about 7 years what we were trying to do is that we were trying to connect doctors in urban india with patients in rural india uh, so we have we were a telemedicine platform that had uh, essentially had a we started off as a call center uh, and and you know one of the things mm-hmm. that i saw in uh, africa really uh, impressed me it was uh, this was 2009 2008 2009 uh, they had this thing called mpesa which was digital payments and uh, it was quite incredible because you know i had you and you could use it on a feature phone this is 10 years ago on a i don't know if you guys even have seen feature <laughs> phones but they don't have a big screen they don't have a touch screen they just have buttons on it and uh, you have the small you have the small screen that you uh, you know there was nokia have you guys seen feature phones anybody yes sir yeah sir i have it right now okay why do you have a feature phone no uh, i just have it i don't use it okay so uh, with these feature phones with no apps right so it, it's a very simple mobile phone no apps nothing uh they had something that is better than what we have today in terms of paytm and upi and all those things or it felt like that to me right because you could go open an mpesa account with a sim card <clears throat> and then you had money on your uh, phone and then you could send it to absolutely anybody in the country so i had used mpesa to buy you know uh, one late night snack like one single egg on the street and like paid somebody you know 5 shillings which is like 3 rupees using my phone uh i had no change and i've also used that to like uh buy an airline ticket and pay for a hotel room so you could like mm. you know and the good thing was that anybody who had a phone in kenya had access to it and right. uh, what it had done for kenya is that it had dramatically changed access to a particular service so for example we take uh, do all of you have bank accounts no so you will have bank account some day right like soon so yeah inshallah <laughs> so uh you know africa in africa they want enough you know in uh, in kenya specifically they want enough banks uh, people were living in fairly rural areas so most people did not have access to a safe place to put their money uh and places like nairobi there was also a lot of crime so you know people literally put their money under their bed because there was no bank there's no place to put it and there was crime so you actually end up losing a lot of money and uh, what 
a simple innovation like this did for Kenya was that it, it changed the number of people who had access to a you know safe bank account from like some 10% of the country had it to like some 60, 80% of the country just through this simple. So to me, I was like, if, if technology can do this for uh, financial services or access to bank accounts or access to savings, then can this do it for health in India, right? Like, you know, because health also has this massive access problem. Uh, so that was the initial uh, startings of Mira Doctor. And, and we were mostly focused on rural India, what we were trying to be building. So we had a team of doctors who would answer well. You know, we had a 24-hour uh, phone line that we could dial mm -hmm. uh, that came to a call center initially where there were a bunch of doctors who were trained to respond to you, tell you what to do next, uh, and, and really give you advice that, you know, was not driven by any ulterior motive. So we weren't getting right. any money from the drug companies. We were not getting any money from uh, the diagnostic guys. And there's a lot of corruption and kickbacks in medicine. So it, uh, it was important for us to maintain that. And we uh, were focused on reaching people in rural areas, right? So in Maharashtra, we worked in places like Nandurbar, which is uh, very rural and very tribal mm. um, and very hard to access. We, in UP, we worked uh, a lot in Eastern UP. Uh, we worked in Gorakhpur, Faisabad, Again, mm. places that don't have great access. Uh, ultimately, though, after about seven years, and we, we, we as a company also morphed multiple times. We started off as a call center, uh, then had a digital lab, then had, uh, in, we initially had doctors all working for us, then we had a wide distributed net of doctors who could sign in from their devices wherever they are, from their laptop or their mobile phone, and then start talking to patients. But ultimately, we decided to uh, close down the company in 2017. Uh, because frankly, the problem that we were trying to solve wasn't just the technology problem. So then that's, that's one big realization mm -hmm. is that healthcare, uh, you know, so with tech, I can solve one piece of it, but where multiple other things are broken in the system. So if I give them a prescription and they don't have anywhere to go and get the prescription, or if I ask, they need to get a test, but there's no local lab, I can't solve everything with technology, right? Like I, technology can solve sort of this one piece. And so that was a hard problem to solve without having all of these players brought into the loop, which we as a small company then couldn't do. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, the startup journey. So that was, uh, or that was part one of the startup journey. And uh, for the last couple of years, I have been doing consulting. So consulting is, uh, you know, Again, large companies have problems or things that they want to create uh, specifically in health, specifically using technology, and uh, they come to me I, and I help them solve it. Uh, so that's sort of the consulting piece. The consulting is now winding down to close. I'm, I'm back to thinking about what you know, what next, and there's, there's a few things in the pipeline that I can't fully talk about right now because it's too early. Right. But uh, continue to work on the same problems, right? Which is how do you use technology in a way that benefits the country? So uh, the other thing to know in Africa or that I uh, learned in Africa I was surprised by is that, uh, you know, when it comes to some of these health statistics and we, we look at health, uh, you know, there's very simple measures for health. How many people die? How many people fall mm -hmm. sick? Uh, I realized that, you know, parts of rural India are not any better off than Africa. You know, in our right. mind, we have this idea that, okay, you know, things are really bad in Africa, but mm. actually things are really bad here also. Right. Um, and uh, so to me, it's quite criminal that, you know, when we uh, are one of the world's largest economies mm. and we have uh, all of this potential, all of this technology, you know, why are people still dying? You know, why are, right. why are women dying in childbirth? Why are uh, children still malnourished? Right. These are very simple problems right. to solve. They shouldn't be hard problems to solve. These, like these are not, you know, India's biggest problem is not that we don't have enough neurosurgeons to do very high, you know, specialized surgery. Hmm. Our biggest problem is that like, you know, 70% of the women who show up for antenatal care are have iron deficiency anemia. Hmm. And iron is a very simple, you know, you can get, take a simple iron tablet to change your diet. And it's a very right. cheap problem to solve. It's not a very expensive problem to solve. So we have very fun, you know, basic. Uh, so in, in medicine, we... Uh, in MBBS, we have this term called BMR, uh, mm -hmm. which is which has you know, the clinical is uh, basic metabolic uh, basal metabolic rate. Mm. Uh, but when we were studying, we would say that iska BMR high hai, which means that iska basics mein rada hai. So mm -hmm. that was it. Now. And so India ka BMR high hai. 
ஒரு <laughs> uh things that you enjoy doing or or problems that you uh, that you might uh, fall in love with and uh, and try and find the intersection of the two that gives you a sense of where you want to go internally and then also try and see uh, you know how valuable are these things right what what is uh, what is the world reward uh, and and then try and find uh, sort of the intersection of all three of these and and that's the that's part of the exercise that uh, that we that we work with them on but uh, in your case i i you know in your journey seems uh, you you started off the wanting to become a pilot and, but then everything after that seems like you fell more and more in love with the problem that you want to solve and um, uh, so maybe you could talk about that like how uh, like how, why is that become sort of this guiding uh, guiding uh, sort of principle in in how you are structuring your uh, your career and and what are what are the uh, what are the pros of falling in love with the problem and also then what are the costs of of doing that and and how does that uh, how does that play in your uh, in your life so you know i'm not a very uh, i'm not a massive planner in life like i'm not it's not like i have my life figured out and so i see it uh, i see a lot of randomness in life right like to to me uh, a lot of these things are very very random like i i happen to meet people i think if you are interested in certain things uh, if you're genuinely interested in certain things uh, and you try and learn about so what what's happened to me is that i started i started getting like you said falling in love with this problem hmm. and started getting interested in the problem other people who were working on the problem uh, reading uh, meeting people so i was just around uh, and and then it's sort of been on autopilot or the career is auto, almost been on you know it, it seems like autopilot although there's a lot of pain <laughs> in there. but uh, but things happen because you will just get expo- the more deeper you go into something hmm. uh, the more exposed you will get to opportunities there uh, i didn't have a you know and when we went to school we didn't really have sessions like this and nobody had asked me about my career till like you know right. besides like ghar pe beta kya banega like nobody asking anything else right? mm. like this career <laughs> counselor and like there's nothing else um but to me you know when i was a child i thought airplanes were cool so then i'll become a fighter pilot i'd seen two three movies i'd right. seen top gun and a few other things and i was pretty happy <laughs> and i like video games right like so i was like okay right. perfect um but uh, once in the real world i started you know i don't know if i don't know if i'd have been happy as a fighter pilot Mm. and like uh, because i be sitting there trying to write tomorrow some long ass manual mm. and then like you know fill 20 forms to like you know get mm. my plane and i'm like you know now i know some fighter pilot trends and i know what they like right. like, like <laughs> filling forms a lot uh, but i think it's important to uh, a enjoy what you do so i think uh, and you can arrive at it both ways i didn't enjoy what i did when i started in fact you know a lot of medical college also i didn't enjoy like karna padta mm. but like mm. uh, really really hard and <laughs> right. i wouldn't um so i wouldn't go back i i wouldn't recommend somebody else to land up in medical college without wanting to do it because it's actually a lot of work right, right. And, and what i've now realized is that uh, you're very lucky if you can find work that you're genuinely interested in uh, and mm-hmm. because then it doesn't feel like work it feels like play uh, mm. it feels like you're playing a game because mm. Uh, that's how interested you are so try and find that i think the other thing is that try and uh, especially somebody who's who's thinking about their careers now uh, the world is being turned on its head right now right like unimaginable things have happened or and things that you know my generation hasn't seen my right. father's generation hasn't seen um and 
so a lot is changing in the world. So also think about, uh, you know, where the world is and how it's going to change because there might be a lot of new career options. Some old career options might die, but there might be a lot of new career options to also think about. Uh, but uh, try, and, try and understand something at the core of it. Try and go deep. I don't think education ends, right? Like I don't think education ends mm -hmm. at school. Uh, I think if you can, the other thing is that if you can fall in love with the process of learning, right? Like if you, because I'm still learning today, Mm. And I'm learning about things that I'm excited about. I, you know, I'm reading papers, I'm reading books or whatever else, but I'm quite excited about it. So I, mm. these are things that I really want to know. Like I want to know kaisa kyu hota hai, mm. right? And that's, that's why I go and read these things. But uh, if you can fall in love with the process of learning, uh, and it's okay to make whatever choice you make right now, because as long as you can broadly have your principles correct, you land in the right place. Right. So if people tell you that, you know, 12th standard will define your life, it doesn't define your life. Because I told you know, this is the most important exam. Right. This is the most important exam. Exactly. Then for CT ke time, bola, this is the most important exam in your life. You know, MBBS, final year, again, they told you this is the most important exam in your life. There is no most important exam in your life. So, but, you know, if, if you... And I think everybody eventually finds it, but uh, if you can figure out a way to like the process, right? It doesn't matter. The marks don't matter. None of that matters. But if you can enjoy learning about something, it could be anything. It could be fixing a car. It could be writing a computer program. It could be uh, understanding, you know, biology and healthcare. Wide range of things. But can you enjoy the process of get? Because you'll have to get really good at it to be valuable in the world. And can you enjoy the process of getting good at it? So uh, this interesting uh, thing that you spoke about, like uh, find something that uh, that feels like play to you and feels like work to others. Uh, why why would you recommend that? Like what usse kya hota hai? What's the benefit of, of finding something like that? Be because I have very limited willpower, right? Like so, if there is something that mm -hmm. I don't enjoy doing, you know, jack market mein dus din ke liye karega, but right every every day. And, and then if you're doing something that you don't fully enjoy, hmm. you, you're also living in a country of a billion people, right? There are, there are somebody else who really enjoys it. He's going to do hmm. it better than you. Hmm. Uh, and he's going to wake up at 6 a.m. and not sleep till 5 a.m. and keep doing this. Right. Uh, so it's very hard to keep up that pace if you don't genuinely enjoy doing what you're doing. Uh, right. So, so in, in some sense, you're saying that by doing, by finding something that you, uh, that feels like play to you, uh, it also allows you uh, the opportunity to get really good at that thing. And then, and therefore, and that is also really important that there is not just, uh, you know, the reason to find something that you, that you want to do uh, that feels like play is so that you get a chance to become an expert at that. And, and that's when things get valuable uh, for you. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be narrow. You could also be an expert in multiple things, but right. you know, none of those things should. Be, I mean, they will all be hard, right? Like there's no, there's right. you know, which pane ke liye kuch kona padta hai. Like hmm. things are hard, hmm. but uh, you need to enjoy the process. Like if you don't enjoy the process, if it, if you absolutely hate it, and if you're doing hmm. it only because somebody else is telling you to do it, then don't do it, right? Like I. I, I don't know. And also, but the only only caveat there is that uh, also know that even your choices will change as you grow older. Right. You know, some things you like, uh, you will not like as much or not enjoy as much. And some things that you uh, don't enjoy will suddenly start sounding a lot more attractive. Hmm. Uh, because you will go through a normal process of growth and that doesn't stop in, in college or it doesn't stop in, you know, whatever. It'll, it'll continue. I'm, I'm almost 40 and I'm still, you know, some of my likes and dislikes are still changing. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if this is good advice for students, Anurud, but I'm essentially saying that load not Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's perfectly good advice because everyone else is telling them, ki, uh, you know, like they told us, right, this is the most important exam of your life. And I think that lie continues to persist, and uh, and and a lot of uh, a lot of that. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people. So he, I think this is, this is also another interesting thing, right? One of the questions I got uh, from our students uh, 
you know when we told them that uh, that we're going to be talking to you about this they're like you know how does someone achieve this honor and uh, of of you know reaching wherever you are and and that was a question uh, to uh, that that is asked of you and and uh, you know right now your answer just seems to be you find something that you uh, that you really want to do and then you just keep playing around with it and and eventually you you end up at that place so um, so you don't you know this thing about having it all figured out and and that you know everyone expects you at least someone uh, someone who has achieved uh, whatever you've achieved uh, to to have stuff figured out uh, uh, do you like do you do you, do you have stuff figured out no no uh, and, and that i i think that's also that's also kind of interesting the other thing i want to talk about is 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 failure um so uh, so you you didn't uh, you you failed at your whatever i guess not failed but you did poorly in, in the 12th grade uh, and uh, and and that uh, that could you could have considered that as uh, as failure but you sort of reacted differently and and try to uh, prove yourself doing something else and and uh, but uh, you know how is your how is your opinion of failure changed uh, since then to to now when you tried to uh, you know you put your heart and soul into starting a company you worked at it for 7 years and and then you had to wind up right so in in some sense that that can also be considered failure so how do you uh, how has your view of failure changed and uh, and uh, you know from then till now i I I don't think my basic view of failure has changed uh, and I can think of you know sort of two academic failures and sort of one work failure right but uh, I think I'm I can look back and hindsight is 2020 so it's easier to look back and say okay this is what failure did for me but now when I look back uh, every point of failure um uh, was like a launch pad so every time i failed and you know it's mm. not so you know you fail then you feel terrible for some days and that's completely okay and that you'll go through the grieving process and you'll go through all of that and that's completely okay but essentially every time i failed i've been able to come back stronger because i learned something from that failure uh and so you know one is this whole twel standard thing it wasn't a failure it was just like you know we live in a very highly competitive society so agar 99% right. marks nahi aaye to fir that was a failure right right uh, right like you know so i got a uh, ended up getting some uh, 80 something in maths and a you know 96 and a 97 in uh, physics and chemistry but that 80 something in maths was a failure in those times right uh, but uh, and it definitely felt like a failure right like it felt mm. uh, terrible mm. एग्जाम and that felt a lot lot worse right because right. my whole class was graduating uh, mm. what was quite cool though was that you formed these very tight bonds in medicine mm. Uh, mm. and my class decided that they'll wait for all of us to graduate so they we had a graduation oh, wow. together so the whole class waited 6 months we graduated together as a class uh, still very very grateful right to yeah yeah class dragging around but uh, after that you know that failure was and it was pretty significant i felt like shit for like mm. can i say shit on this call uh, well, probably not but you've said it already so we <laughs> fine say it again for like shit <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know and it, it was quite terrible right like because you you mm. feel like a whole class has gone ahead etc like lots of things happened then um but you know within a year and a half i had a 1540 on my gre and i was at harvard Mm. right so like each of these things uh i think there's now when i see failure i think you know something great is going to happen in two years right after the failure that's how i see failure now mm. uh, i mean i am sure i'll still feel like shit and like all of that will happen but mm. uh, you know the failure is a is a stepping stone to something like because it, you clearly learn something because somebody who's lucky and hasn't failed hasn't learned these lessons in life mm so you learn that lesson question is can you get better right and uh, every failure will teach you something right but you you still have to be uh, you still have to find that lesson in there 
uh, it's not going to teach it to you for free. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, just ask you a couple of questions that, uh, that I got uh, from, uh, from our students. Um, and, you know, so Kirti loves to ask this question and, and I love it as well. So uh, hers, uh, her, her repeat favorite is, what advice would you give to your 16-year-old self? Uh, I would, uh, what I told you guys earlier, right? this is not the most important exam in your life. Right. Lord Matlab. We get told that a lot in India, so I just yeah. like. No, actually, the way I started off this course is, uh, is I asked the students, uh, what is the one lie that you've been told? And uh, and all of them knew that this is the lie. Like, <laughs> that this is the lie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so they have a lot more, uh, they've built a lot more insight than we had, certainly. Uh, we actually, we, we actually believed that. Um, and uh, so, so I guess the second part of the question is that, uh, what happens if you haven't figured out your passion, uh, even even after the twelfth grade? So passion is, you know, it's very it's romanticized and like whatever else. Like for most of my career, I didn't think I had a passion. Then it takes somebody else to sort of turn around and say, "Hey, this is your passion because you keep doing all of these things, right?" Like it's not like I knew key, and it's not. And in your mind, when you think passion, you think a guy strumming a guitar and like singing a song, which I never mm. had. Right? Like so, I think. Passion was ki baat hai. like just enjoy like if you're able to do stuff well and wake up in the morning and like you know enjoy what you're doing and enjoy and, and essentially try and problem solve right like because you guys also have the luxury of having an education which again most people don't have um, so think about what problems you can solve think about what you can build think about uh, and that's what you know ultimately human progress is based on we have to be better than what our parents were we have to be better than what people in our lives have to be better than uh, two generations ago and every generation has to create something new. So think about that. Think about, uh, you know, what problem do you want to solve or what do you want to do? You know, what do you, enjoy? or even look at now, you've done a m bunch of different things. What do you really enjoy? Uh, of course, look at what you're good at, right? Like if you have a crazy talent in something, and I didn't have that. I didn't, it's not like, you know, I would sing and everybody would be like, okay, this is an incredible voice or I was a maths genius or you know, or a computer genius or any of that. And there are some kids who are that, right? And if, and you, if you're that, then you probably already have something that you're really good at. Um, I'm now rambling. I've, I've forgotten your question. Of it. <laughs> so that, I, I think you, I think you did fine. Um, so uh, can you, can you then, I guess there are a few people that, uh, that have the question uh, like uh, Nandan and Aditya uh, as well as Shri Is, uh, you know, what if we made you the, uh, the, the czar for Indian healthcare? Like what, if you, if you, if you could be in, in charge of these things, uh, what would you do? Uh, how would you do things differently than, than what, uh, what is being done today? Uh, I what I've realized and learned about healthcare over the last uh, 15, 20 years, I guess, is that there are no simple, simple, simplistic solutions. Um, I think uh, broadly, what I would do is I would try and we've what we've had is we've had healthcare specialize a lot, right? Like, so now even in your story, there were some three, four specialists there. Right, right. And ideally you didn't need that. Uh, hmm. I would make sure that everybody has a great uh, local guy they can trust, guy, girl, uh, hmm. whatever, that they can trust, uh, have a GP that uh, can help solve, like so somebody who is on your side, who helps you figure this out and moves you from really expensive treatment to really more prevention. So, mm. you know, don't let your kidneys fail. Don't let uh, these bad things happen because when, when, once these bad things happen, it ends up costing a lot of money. It's very hard. So I would broadly try and move uh, even our idea. See, what is, the, we, we now call it healthcare, but it's actually not mm. healthcare. It is sick care, right? Because mm. our, it's meant for sick people to come and then get care. Uh, but can we build a true healthcare system where we all have mm. okay health now? Can we now figure out a way to maintain that and not fall sick? Mm. Uh, so those are some things that I would think about. I'd figure out a way. So I don't have a, you know one answer, but right. broadly that direction. But then India also has, there are different problems to solve for all of us in this call. 
hmm. uh, which have more to do with you know the cost of care and availability versus somebody sitting in a tribal district who has right. nothing around right so there's a different problem that needs to be so there's no one problem for india which is why we are a federation of 30 states uh, hmm. and even within the states there are you know very local level problems which are very different so the other thing so i don't think uh, czar is the right uh, framework for india at all hmm. right like what you hmm. really want in india is you want to enable local communities to be able to solve their own problems Yeah. Uh, and give them the give them the tools help them make decisions because if you make one decision for india that applies to the whole nation you will be wrong it's wrong mm. right. you will have you know you'll have different so for example uh, there's this in in epidemiology there's this thing called an epidemiological transition mm. uh, where so for example in 1990 uh, for most of the country uh, if you looked at what people were dying from and what uh, Uh, you know what people are falling sick from hmm. uh, it was mostly what we call infectious disease and nutritional uh, so hmm. you know people in malnutrition or people at tb or malaria and that was causing the most amount of destruction hmm. um, but if you look at 2020 uh, 60% of that the same proportion that was caused by all these conditions like infectious disease hmm. is now caused by things like diabetes heart disease cancer so the diseases right. that we are dying from has changed mm. right so our whole system also needs to know and these are not diseases that uh, tb is relatively easy to cure like right. if i diagnose you of tb and if i give you the right antibiotics you'll be cured like in you know mm. six months you're done uh, most likely right? Uh, right but in diabetes i can't cure you yeah you know you might end up taking drugs for the rest of your life uh, unless there are fundamental things that can change about how you live Hmm. Uh, so we need a different kind of health system to start looking at these uh, but that's not the whole picture because the, uh, diabetes and lifestyle diseases have only become the majority in the south of the country matlab gujarat hmm. maharashtra and down hmm. uh, up and bihar still have a lot of tb still have a lot of malaria right. so again you know you need to have different solutions for different places because the problems in different places are different hmm. okay um so i guess th- there are a bunch of que- bunch of questions on like how do you become a doctor uh, uh, you know uh, parimal uh, who we met earlier wants to know how do you memorize uh, enough to uh, to get through the exams uh, and uh, and you know there there are a few questions about you know just what does it take to uh, to get in and, and become a doctor so i don't know what the exams are like now uh um, like i said our batch was the first sort of guinea pig batch that went through you know for the first year in maharashtra we had a common entrance exam uh, what is it called now does anybody know it was called mhct then i think there is still some sort of mhct but there are other exams as well right so uh to me i, I don't think you should memorize yeah memorizing because kitna memorize karoge bahut there's a lot to memorize uh i would rather understand you know there are some fundamental principles that you need to memorize but you can't memorize every fact about it right you need to sort of build this whole idea of mental models where you need to understand some fundamental core principles and then you should be able to derive an answer after that based on these core principles so that you don't have to memorize the whole book you have to memorize what you think is core uh, i don't know if that makes sense as an answer but i can you can you talk a little bit more about that like give me an example of of what uh, of what mental models you have that help you sort of process any new information coming out of on the health healthcare side or health uh, side sure so you know one uh, i'm trying to think so you know one is let me talk about covid and now you know this i we've been looking at covid i i've been sort of tracking this since early jan right um and now i don't know anything about uh, what covid was or any of the, i didn't know any any of that in early jan hmm. uh, but i knew a few things about how diseases spread uh, right so in in early jan i knew that this is a respiratory virus hmm uh, this is highly infectious um and you know respiratory virus is the easiest thing to spread right because you just have to depending on how yeah. it spread you just have to speak to somebody and they'll get the yeah 
they you don't have to touch them you don't have to do anything right it's it, it so uh, so to me you know this idea of knowing what are the different forms of so i didn't have to know about covid specifically but i knew how diseases spread mm. and that was my mental model right it's not like i'd memorized there are some you know 50 types of coronaviruses and right. there are there must be people who have memorized every type of coronavirus its characteristics what its spike proteins and everything else which i mm. did mm. but even having a basic understanding of how diseases spread uh, you know what does respiratory transmission look like what does food borne transmission look like there's there, and there's mm. some principles to memorize there it allows you to uh, draw conclusions and at least have uh, a sense of what is happening uh, you know with whatever problem that you're looking at uh, without necessarily having memorized absolutely everything uh i don't know how that works for so don't take my advice on exam prep here i don't know how that works for exams <laughs> uh, right but uh, in life i think it's very important to conceptually understand things versus memorize a bunch of things so you know simply in maths you know even even say board maths or knowing how uh, how you do arithmetic uh, is very very important mm. because that's a fun, very fundamental principle of how you uh, you know do number operations right and that's something that you must be familiar with and that's a very core principle that if you know that you can do a lot more beyond that okay cool uh, i'm actually just going to open it up to any uh, anyone here uh, who has questions so you can unmute yourself and uh, talk to ajay directly uh, i I've, i've tried to cover some of your questions from the uh, forms that you sent in but uh, i guess along the way uh, along this conversation you might have come up with some new questions so uh, so we have about 8 odd minutes for uh, for you guys to go ahead and ask questions over there no and i'm just looking at the chats i i uh, yeah. there's a there's a message in epidemiology epidemiology is a study of epidemics of any kind not just infectious disease of any kind so you know diabetes is an epidemic in india because enough people have diabetes uh, it is not an infectious disease so you would also use the same broad science to study the spread of any disease okay are you guys feeling less intimidated of ajay now that you can ask him your questions directly or is he still scaring you and you are not asking any questions i have a question yeah go ahead you uh, i just say you told that uh, while you go in the dissection while you go in the room where all the bodies are kept for dissection so uh, for avoiding those mind boggling things and all would you prescribe any kind of mindset we should keep or something no explain the question to me i don't understand the question um uh it's like you told while means uh, around the dissection body when you go it feels like uh, what to do now and passing a shoot pair it is like so would you like to tell anything that uh, to avoid these kind of things uh, like pressure and all what should we do so uh, you know i'm sorry i in what i meant it was that my mind was blown in a positive way i, right. I thought this was very cool <laughs> you know i wasn't so there were other other people who fainted and all but like i had a very different reaction my reaction was oh this is so damn cool like i you know who would have thought that i would get this chance to do this because i i hadn't imagined myself doing that but i think that uh, the other thing is that uh, you know basic mindset parimal frankly is that uh, you can't control you can only control your mindset the only thing that you can control is your mindset every and your reaction to what the world is throwing at you because the world is completely you know the, there might be no order and uh, reason or rhyme or reason for why something happens to you so if you accept that and you say you know i will take what, whatever the world throws at me but i will react based on who i am and how i want, want to react to it i will set the rules on how i react and i will let the world set the rules on how i react. and that i think is a, a good mindset to deal with things that are unexpected because you can't control the world outside right like the world outside or whatever the circumstances that are happening to you are not under your control there are infinite reasons why something happens uh, the only thing you can control is how you react to it how what what is your reaction when you see something and that should you know if and that is something that i would work on and that's something i think all of us should work on 
and nobody's perfect right like so i still have hmm. reactions i'm not uh, that i'm ashamed right i reacted badly or whatever but uh, that is something that i still is something that i'm still learning and i think it would help all of us to learn is how do you manage your reaction to something cool uh, do you have any other questions nope i think that's it all right ajay thanks so much for taking the time out uh, i'll i'll pardon me no oh, i i'm very really quiet so i'm wondering if i really bored them i i don't think it's you uh, i think there are few things one is the format uh, of uh, of zoom uh, is is far less interactive than uh, than if you were to actually meet someone in uh, in real life and, and i think the second thing is that uh, i guess our our students still have to get used to uh, talking to unfamiliar people right <laughs> like they they feel much more comfortable sending me questions <laughs> and and me asking them to you uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll get better and, and better at questions that i can take later i'm happy to sort of respond on text or whatever amrit you can you and i can talk yeah cool uh, if if there are some questions that you guys have uh, uh, from this session do send them to uh, manjuri or myself and and we'll we'll try and get you an answer from the great doctor ajay nair all right thanks so much everyone for coming in and ajay thanks to you uh, thanks ajay thank I'll you happy you. independence day happy independence day see you soon see you bye bye